Hello everyone and welcome. I'm Sarah Shaffey and it's a delight to be celebrating the big Jubilee Read with this event, Writing from Across the Commonwealth, which is in partnership with Libraries Connected West Midlands. The Big Jubilee Read is celebrating great reads from across the Commonwealth to coincide with the Queen's Platinum Jubilee, with an expert panel, including librarians and booksellers, picking 10 books for each decade of Elizabeth II's reign. The Big Jubilee Read is delivered by National Charity, the Reading Agency, in partnership with BBC Arts, with funding from Arts Council England, and is supported by Libraries Connected and the Booksellers Association. It's wonderful that this event is connected with Libraries Connected West Midlands. In July, Birmingham will host the Commonwealth Games, so it's an appropriate time to be talking about the Commonwealth as it stands in 2022. So let's just do that with our authors now. Later on, I'll be joined by Marcus Suzak, but first I'd like to welcome Jing Jing Lee and Jacob Ross. Jing Jing Lee is the author of How We Disappeared, which was shortlisted for the 2020 Singapore Literature Prize and long listed for the 2020 Women's Prize for Fiction. It's a dual narrative set both in Singapore in both 1942 and in 2000. Jacob Ross is the author of The Bone Readers, which won the inaugural Jalak Prize in 2017. He's also the associate fiction editor at People Tree Press, a publisher that specialises in writing from the Caribbean, its diasporas and the UK. Welcome to both of you. It's lovely to have you here. Thank you. And um, your books are very different, but first I'd love for you to talk about um, the settings a little bit. They're, they're both places that you have strong links to and history with. So uh, Jing, I wonder if you could start a little by telling us about how your own family history perhaps inspired you to write How We Disappeared and kind of the, the, how it informed the setting as well. Um, I was born and raised in Singapore. I'm actually supposed to be in Singapore in July for the first time in three years. Um, so it's um, it's going to be a, a, I think a rough re-entry. Um, but I wrote this book partially because I wasn't done writing about this character from my uh, a short story collection slash novella. And I was obsessed with this one woman that I later called Wang Di in this book and how we disappeared. Um, and I had to chase her ghost. I couldn't let her go and I ended up writing about her for um, seven years, I think. Um, that is one reason I was just chasing a ghost. Um, I actually did not know that I was writing uh, about my family's history, not consciously, because I knew like bits and pieces of what had happened to my family during the war but not to the extent that I did in the book. Um, I think the stronger, more emotional reason, the second reason is um, I started writing this book during my master's um, in creative writing. And I remember talking to my course mates and these are intelligent, uh, eloquent, widely read people, all of them. But very few of them had heard about the details of the Japanese occupation of Singapore. Um, and the conversation about the war was focused only on how the Americans had been wrong to bomb Japan. And of course, it, I mean, uh, the nuclear weapons, the use of nuclear weapons is always wrong. I, I, I would never condone it in any sense. Um, but what they neglected to think about, um, what I didn't even know about was the fact that from Four million people had died in Indonesia during the war uh, from famine and forced labor. And that um, if, the, if Japan hadn't capitulated, my family wouldn't have survived. Uh, a part of them were killed during the, the, the uh, invading forces, uh, when, when invading forces came into Singapore. And when I said that to my friends, they were, that was a bit of a stunned silence and apologetic silence as well. So to have that anger from, you know, from that not knowing people having not even heard about this to people writing to me, uh, telling me that they had, you know, learned something from reading this book. Uh, I think that was actually the reason why I wrote the, the book I did. I'd love to ask you more about that in just a moment. But Jacob, I wonder if you could first talk a little bit about the Bone Readers. It has such a strong sense of place. Can you tell us about your connection to the Caribbean and how you came to write this particular book? Yes. Um, and I'd love to have a, a 
a bit of a um, cross talk with Jinji Media about her book, which resonated with enormously with me. Um, I wasn't. I, I spent some time in South Korea about ten years ago, and you have a similar, you know, kind of narrative about the way women were used um, by Japanese as comfort women, and and the resentment is still very strongly there. But um, to talk a bit about my, I mean, I, I wrote. I never intended to write uh, crime fiction uh, 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 or literary crime uh, fiction, but I was reading um, a few years ago, but about five years ago, I, I, I was reading an article in one of the national newspapers here that did a roundup of all the crime novels around the world. Um, and there was not one Caribbean book on there. So I, and so I did some research and realized that the Caribbean doesn't have you know, crime writers and crime is it's a bit of a resource in the Caribbean as it is in other parts of the world. And I was wondering why, why, why that was the case. And I thought that I would leave my other kinds of fiction aside for a bit and write a crime novel. And the great irony or paradox is that those, those have been so far my most successful books. And I, I, I love it, but I resent it a bit because I've been spending so many years <laughs> writing literary fiction and hoping to make some kind of inroads. And I, to a certain extent I have, but the books which have been successful are the book, why, why the Caribbean and why the, uh, why the sense of place? Because I think, I think that there's an idea of the Caribbean that I wanted to, to invite people to re-examine. And that is a place, you know, it's a place of sun, sea, you know, it's a place of leisure, hotel, cocktails, you know, that kind of stuff. And I was suggesting that beneath that, that, that beautiful veneer, there is something else. There is, first of all, there are people who actually live there. There is humanity. Uh, people who have very, very similar aspirations that in a broader sense, the, the, the topography of the human heart is the same everywhere. Um, people die. You know, people people kill, people achieve. You know, so I wanted to do that, but I, and, and I also wanted to to um to give a sense that it, it's one of the youngest civilizations in the world, the Caribbean, and it's a living, thriving thing that goes beyond the stereotypes and the cliche. And you cannot, we, we cannot talk about the Caribbean without talking about the thing that's most obvious, and that is the sheer, almost shocking beauty of the place. It is, it is as a person who returns occasionally to visit friends, family, uh, it always strikes me when I land, you know, how, how, how powerful this place is in terms of just the primary colors that shout at you and so on and so forth. So I thought that that is, was quite an important aspect mm -hmm. of the, of the writing, yeah. It's it's so interesting because as you were you were speaking there in, and as you were sort of talking about how people often think of the Caribbean as a place of sort of beaches and sun and sea and sand, uh, Jing was nodding along because I guess people also think of Singapore as this place where they go on holiday and it's kind of glamorous and, and beautiful and then they leave and there there isn't really, I guess, what both of your books, even though they are about such vastly different places and people, really have that idea in common that there is life lived in these places that that probably we don't really think about because we have a very particular view of them and and Jacob it's interesting that how we disappeared resonated with you and Jing I wonder if it was the other way around as well and it seems there are these sort of commonalities that both of you have found. I mean what he said about <laughs> how these places have actual real people living in it I think that's what is important about these books, not, not just our books, but books that are not set in, um, you know, London or New York or California. Um, these books also help to humanize people living within, within those societies. And in my book, um, as well as Jacob's, I think there's this, it helps to have characters who are fully rounded so that people start to see you know, Singaporeans and Caribbean people um, as fully 3D, 4D, and as people with their own desires and dreams and faults. And um, I hope, I 
hope to really have achieved that with this book because um, even with some of some of the characters that I wouldn't say I liked very much, for example, uh, Mrs. Sato, the owner of the comfort house, um, I tried to humanize her as best as I could. And that's how you get people to understand each other and how you get people to understand people who don't necessarily live in the same place they do and don't live in a society that looks like theirs. So that, I mean, that's why I was nodding because Singapore looks like this shiny, modern um, utopia in some sense, because people are always talking about how they want uh, London to be a little bit like Singapore. And I'm thinking, do you really know what Singapore is like? I'm not sure. You're thinking about the money. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Other than that, I'm not so sure. Yeah. I think you've achieved. I think you've you've achieved it brilliantly. Um, mm -hmm. It's a very very strong book. I mean, um, it, it grabs you. And I haven't finished reading it, and that's because I started just recently. But I had to make a, a choice between going to bed. Um, so I can be ready for this or finishing the book. So I, I chose to go to bed, but you know, I'll, I'll finish it after this interview. It'll be nice, it was fantastic. In terms of your characters, they literally punch their way through the page. Um, very, very good, very good writing. And I'm, I'm not saying this, you know, because I want to be generous. I'm saying it because it's true. <laughs> um, the best thing to hear, thank you. <laughs> what has been, I mean, have you, have you spoken to people who have, have read the, your books and what has been their reactions to kind of seeing these, these worlds um, in, their, in their truth, sort of below the, the veneer? Like, have, have you surprised people, do you think? Um, have you challenged the ways, the ideas that people have about, well, Jacob, why don't you take this one first? Have you, do you think you challenged the idea that people have about the, the Caribbean? Yeah, absolutely. Um, there are quite a few reviews out there, uh, you know, as, as responses to the bone readers. And one of the things that, that, that people have, people always note, uh, apart from the, 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 apart from, you know, the deployment of the language and the characters, is the fact that, that this is a world they, they, they knew nothing about. And it, in a way, achieved what I wanted it to achieve, which was to, ask hard questions of the, and challenge the ideas that we have of the Caribbean, for example, that, that these are places like Singapore, um, like as Jindy was pointing out, that they have deep histories, they have histories of trauma also. They have, they have histories that sometimes one is tempted to turn one, one's back you know, towards, but at the end of the day, these are histories. I mean, what I think, our books have in common is the fact that they seek to excavate, they seek, they, they seek to present, to bring to the light, to the fore, um, aspects of our reality, which are not necessarily, you, you know, there in front of people for them to see, but which are to us extremely important. Mm. You know, that's I love that, I, that word excavation is so good. And, and Jing, I just wondered if you could talk about the reader response but I also wondered if you've had any responses from people that that have a history that have like a similar history to that which is uh which your characters have and kind of how they feel about people finally sort of finding out and understanding on a mass scale what what the history of Singapore was what the the, the Japanese occupation kind of all of that sort of stuff have you had anything like that from readers well, on seven different levels, yes, um, because I have I've had people from uh, Malaysia, um, Indonesia write to me to say that this was something that they have, you know, longed to read about for years because their grandmothers and families have told them about the war, and this is something that has been missing from the bookshelves in a way. Um, I've also had, interesting enough, I've also had Japanese readers mm -hmm. get in contact with me. Um, I was in Australia doing uh, the Adelaide Writers Festival and this Japanese woman came up to me to say that she was looking forward to reading my book. She had been at the event and she was getting my signature and she was 
thrilled to find something that was about this part of history that has always been kept from her because she told me that this was not in the textbooks. She had never read about this and she was really excited to read about this. Um, I've also had people who wrote to me about how they were sorry, actually, now how um, these women have been treated because, I mean, <laughs> the, the, the truth is this is not uh, reflected in the education system in Japan, not in the way that it is in Germany, for example. And the German education system tries to teach the students about what happened during the war, their part in it. But um, I, to my knowledge, to this day, I, that hasn't been the same with Japan. Um, so um, the readers from Japan who've gotten back to me about this, I think that has been the most gratifying bit about, um, um yeah hearing from readers i guess it shows really shows the the power of fiction sometimes to do what non-fiction can't do or it or isn't doing in some places like you like you say um i wanted to talk a little bit about um the idea of the commonwealth and what the commonwealth does and doesn't mean to us in 2022 and i think in the uk it's not really something we we think about on a on a regular basis and I actually had to look up a definition so that I could I could um sort of see how it is described and Encyclopedia Britannica describes the Commonwealth as a free association of sovereign states comprising the United Kingdom and the number of its former dependencies who have chosen to maintain ties of friendship and practical cooperation and who acknowledge the British monarch as symbolic head of their association that's quite a mouthful um <laughs> but it also I think I think it it's sort of sometimes maybe I I personally think it obscures quite a lot it couches kind of formerly colonized countries as Absolutely. dependencies which I think Absolutely. is is a much nicer word um, and it also gives an umbrella term to what is actually a really really varied group of of countries I wondered if you could talk a little bit and um about how you personally define literature from from the commonwealth is there is there a commonwealth canon and how do you feel about the commonwealth label sort of being applied to your work um jacob maybe if you can take this to yeah. talk about both your own work and perhaps a little bit about the yeah. books that you publish at people tree press yeah. as well it, 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 yeah it's, it's a I mean, when you talk about the commonwealth the 53 or 54 nations of the commonwealth it it, it doesn't um, mean as a writer to me as a writer it doesn't mean much because the com the, com the commonwealth comprises one third of the surface area of of the globe basically um 50, uh, some of the smallest and some of the largest nations on, um, on earth uh, if you talk about you know the island which i'm from Grenada, that's 133 square miles compare that with canada which is one of the biggest countries you know in the world and stuff Plus the fact that the Commonwealth had its roots in a, in a very interesting conference of Brit Britain, of, of, of um, England or Britain, um, Canada, New Zealand, um, South Africa, interestingly enough, you know, um, and uh, I think it was Ireland at the time. And these nations, when you look at the, they, they, are, they are really Europeans, they are white nations. You know, coming together to uh, you know um, to 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 discuss probably you know their interests. And so later on, it was changed when these countries became independent. But I wouldn't go on about it. The Commonwealth has become interesting again, I think, to Britain post Brexit. Mm -hmm. uh, it's very important because with 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 with, with um, this sort of shift away from the Europe, um, the European Union, uh, you know, the Brexiteers uh, 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 talk quite a lot, in fact, about um, Empire too, basically, you know, the, the whole idea of these countries becoming markets again and, you know, and exploiting, whatever. I can go on forever about that, but I wouldn't. Um, but my history is not a history of Canada or Australia, even though I love the literature that comes from there. I, I, I um, in fact, if an Aborigine, uh, Aboriginal person who writes a novel, I may find myself identifying more with the experience than I am than, than with your classic Australian. And that's not casting aspersion. You know, the dominant population in Canada 
probably trace their roots to Europe. Yeah. And the literature that come from it, beautiful stuff, fine literature, but I would probably be more interested. I, I, I resonate more with the literature coming from the, 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 Native, Amer the Native Canadians who were there. You see what I'm saying? Because that the relationship is very different. It's one of having been dominated, having been, you know, and, and the kind of the, the kind of cruelties that Jing Jing Li is talking about in relation to the Japanese, you know, I can identify with that in a different context, you know, um, the Caribbeans who, who, who were, the people who were brought to the Caribbean, the majority of them, not all of them, who came to the Caribbean, did it, they, 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 they came under duress, so to speak, you know? So that it's a very different kind of narrative. Um, even if I like the idea of the Commonwealth and where it really achieves its resonance and its value is culturally, we talk about the Commonwealth Games, for example, or the Commonwealth's um, the, um, short story prize or the Commonwealth, yeah, the, the, the soft power aspect of it, you know, um, Commonwealth scholarships and so on. That is where I think it becomes, for me personally, more useful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but but the Commonwealth, my, my story, the story of um, the people of the Americas, um, especially the southern part of America. It's a very different story from the, from the story of, let's say, Australia or Canada. And I'm not trying to create a division here, but it's, an, it's important to acknowledge that. And also it's an account of the kinds of problems that we, for example, in the Caribbean confront. We, there are problems which are specific to small nations. For example, you know, we are impacted more profoundly by climate change, for example, and you can talk about the dominant themes, yeah? Um, we, the, the, you know, the rising sea levels, um, there's a kind of vulnerability with, that goes with being small, as a small island um, in the Caribbean or, or, or in the United, you know, a small country. So what I'm getting at here is that we are not talking about the same, and it's interesting, I'll just finish off here, you can edit me out, whatever I'm saying. It's interesting what's happening now with, um, countries more or less declining to have the queen as the head of state anymore. The latest being Barbados last year, 2021, yeah? Um, and, and I think personally that it was very interesting that that happened subsequent to what we call the Rindra scandal, the sense of betrayal that these, these small nations, be, now there, there's a lot of dialogue around, um, around reparations, in other words, turning Britain's attention to the fact that we are countries which have been profoundly affected, even disabled almost, by virtue of the violent history and the violent, violent relationship we have had with you. And we want you to acknowledge this. Um, in Grenada recently, country where I was born, one minister spoke and he said, if, for example, if, um, if the, the two royals um, who were in the Caribbean recently, if they do come to the country, he wanted to talk to them about reparations. I mean, and of course they declined to go. Um, so what I'm getting at here is that, and, and so in a way, I think that it's becoming increasingly uneasy as a relationship with Britain because there are areas of the history that Britain refuses to address and to acknowledge and which people are insisting on that these need to be addressed. Yeah. Mm. Um, uh, Jing, how does or doesn't the, com sort of the Commonwealth label resonate with you? Do you agree that culturally it works quite well? So, or, or kind of, do you have differing thoughts on it? Um, I can only speak from, I think my context, which is the context of what well, used to be Malaya, it's like was a part of Malaya. And um, to put it into um, modern parlance, it is, for me, having Commonwealth is something like kind of downgrading relationship from an ownership to a sort of a friendship where you don't quite know what the other person wants. <laughs> and um, I think at the stage, it's nice for Singapore to have this sort of relationship with Singapore uh, with, um, the UK because 
uh, there's always talk of friendly trade and relations and the queen came to visit and it was, it was great, but it is a little bit to me like uh, a bit of a face saving gesture because obviously what happened was during the war, um, they didn't do enough or they couldn't do enough to help Malaya through. And Singapore was in the end captured by the Japanese. And that led to eventually to the independence of various different colonies. Um, so this was in essence, had to do with Singapore having been lost during a war. Um, and this friend relationship, like Jacob said, doesn't address the things that happened before, uh, you know, during uh, during the colonial times. So, yeah, um, this is sort of connected to that. Um, I'd love for you both to talk about the way that you use language in your novels because I think language is so often tied in uh, with our history. So, um, Jing, maybe let's start with you. So, you write in English, and your characters speak in a number of different languages so they speak in English sometimes they speak in Mandarin they speak in in Japanese um can you talk about how you approach the language that you used in your book um, and sort of the impact of characters not being allowed to speak certain languages um or, and having to speak others perhaps affected the way in which you sort of wrote this book um <laughs> To be honest, the language part was a bit of a nightmare because Singapore being the way it is, people speak um, Singlish. I think you know um, a little bit about that. Um, Singlish comprises of English combined with Chinese, combined with Malay and a bit of Tamil. And it's a bit of a mix, a strange mix to put on page. So that in itself was incredibly difficult to capture faithfully. And I felt that if I concentrated on that, this would be an entirely different book. This would be a book about language. This would be a book about migration, uh, specifically also migration from different parts of China, from South India. Uh, it would be a book that <laughs> I think it would have consumed me. I've taken 10 or 12 years instead of seven. Um, and for me to have to go through that and to really completely faithfully captured that. Um, I, I, I felt that would have taken away from the story that I was trying to tell. So what I did instead was to transpose bits of Chinese into modern Chinese because the Chinese that was captured in this book is not actually the Chinese that was spoken. And to go into the layers of that would have, I would have had to go into the politics of it as well, about migration, about war in China, blah, blah, blah. And I didn't, I chose not to do that. So what I did was to transpose it into simple Mandarin and very simple Malay, because I, uh, I, I understand very little Malay. So I, I used that and mostly made the characters speak in a language that I would have been able to understand as well. In Singapore, and then I translated that into English. Um, the thing with English in today's Singapore, it's a little bit, I wouldn't say it's politicized, but I would say that you would be able to tell where a person is from in the social strata just by listening to them speak. Of course, like in England, the UK as well, it's about the same because my parents grew up poor, um, working class, um, and they speak, they spoke dialect and they speak Mandarin. Um, and they never spoke English to me because they couldn't. My mother only went to primary school for two years, for example. Um, so that the, the language in the novel reflected which um, parts of society these people were from. And I think Kevin and his family, I, I, I those were the easiest to write in terms of the way they spoke because that was quite easy to replicate from what I knew and what people I knew and the way they would speak at home. So the, the, the question of language is always a very intricate, very complicated one within the context, context of Singapore. Yeah, it's because it, it's 
we sort of think, oh, language, it's just some words people are saying. Maybe maybe they have an accent. Maybe there's some other words that they use that are brought in from other places. But it does have so many layers in terms of class and, and wealth and education and all of those things as well. Um, Jacob, let's talk a little bit about the bone readers. So your character speak in, in dialect, which I think really helps to ground us in a very specific place. But I feel it probably could be challenging for people who are used to reading yeah. very standard queen's english and um, why did you choose to to write in dialect and and how how yeah. do you sort of how do you think it enhances the novel because it really does yeah. it was difficult because uh I, you know, and it's, it's a big one it's a big one my my academic background is linguistics and you know so the politics of language i've, I've always you know been very, very present in my head. And it's still very present in my head when I write. But what I'm, I, I put it um, as, as succinctly as I possibly can. When I was going to school, when I was going to, but you know, in the Caribbean, and as a lot of people, in fact, would attest, I wasn't allowed to speak any language but standard English, which wasn't the language of my birth. Um, I grew up speaking a, what you call dialect, what I call a Caribbean Creole. Uh, and it's very similar. And that's what I say to people who don't, who, who tell me they have difficulty getting into some aspects of the, the, the dialogue. I say, just think, you see, it's, uh, you know, think that you're reading an African, you know, an African, it's an African American who is speaking, because I think a lot of it is to do with the, the barriers sometimes the readers put up you know, before they even enter or allow themselves to read. Um, they just think it's not for me because it's Caribbean or whatever. But if, they, if this, they're more familiar, many of them with reading literature where you have African Americans talk um, talking, you know, in, in the narrative and they have no problems with it. And, and I find sometimes the very fact of inviting them to, to think of, of, of the dialogue in that way, uh, it helps and they get into it. What I would say very quickly here is that I have found, and this is my personal conclusion, that one of the most sophisticated readerships in the world is British readership. You know, the people who act the readers, British readers are amazingly sophisticated. I don't think that they, they that, that publishers always act, recognize that and give them books that where they love decoding. I mean, you just need to go look at the kind of reviews you get from British readers. Of, of my book, you know, and, and books like mine, you will see that they have a great appreciation of, of the language in the book. But for me, I wanted to make another point uh, in the writing, which is that one of my characters, she's a, she's a detective um, called Miss Sanis Laws. Miss Sanis Laws speaks Caribbean English-based Creole. She doesn't speak like the other character who speaks standard English, who speaks a bit like the way I speak probably. Um, and I wanted to, uh, but she is the most intelligent person as far as I'm concerned in the book. She has a fine mind. And I wanted to make the statement to say that this is not an inferior language. It's not, a, it's, it's, it's not because a person speaks a particular version of a language or variant to a language that it means that they, 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 they're less intelligent. What it means is that they speak a different language or they have a different manner of speaking. And some of the most intelligent people I know are uh, people who don't speak received English with an accent like some people I can point to, but I'm not allowed to on this program, you know? Um, it is not because one talks posh that one is bright. One talks posh because one has had a, 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 an expensive education, yeah? And perhaps a, a family lineage, but it's, and I, what I'm getting at here is that there is, there is in, my, in terms of my writing, what I also seek to do is to say, here is a character who is speaking as a Caribbean person would because it is a Caribbean book, but who has a brain to die for. You know, it's an incredibly intelligent, perceptive person who happens to articulate her intelligence, her, her, her perspicacity in a language that you may construe to be a dialect. Mm -hmm. You know, it's as simple as that. And there are people who really appreciate that, people who love the book and love that character in particular you know, for, for, for that reason. But it, but I do, it's a statement I'm also making. Um, but I do know also that Caribbean readers 
if I were to make her speak standard English, there are many, many Caribbean readers who would reject the character on the Bronx that she is inauthentic. She doesn't feel real because that's not the way we speak. Yeah. But yeah. Mm. It's, it's fascinating. I could ask you both about sort of the politicization and the, the weaponization of language and, and voice all day long, but we don't have long together. So um, I wanted to just ask you about a couple more things. So I think um, very obviously history infuses both of your novels in, in various ways. Um, Jing, your book sort of weaves back and forth um, through the various characters' lives at various stages. Can you just tell us a little bit about why you wanted to, to have that kind of interwoven structure where we, where we go back to the past and then we come back into the present um, of various characters' lives? Well, to me, it, it was very clear that it needed to be Wangti's story from the beginning. Um, but like I said, it is to do with um, trying to transpose a person's thoughts on a page, uh, but then you have to keep in mind that she is illiterate. She doesn't speak English. So how am I going to do this? Um, and even with the third person perspective, there's this distance, because I start out with a third person perspective and you see her as an elderly woman, you see her, but then you're a little bit removed from her, from her um, contemporary life, from her way of being at that point in time. And what I did was I moved them back into the past and that past is from the first person point of view. And that becomes suddenly a lot more intimate. And then it's Kevin, who's also, uh, whose story is also told from the first person point of view. So the whole idea of having these different voices was also to show um, where these people are from uh, at that point in time. And Kevin's role in the story was to give Wang Ti a voice. Because at the end, the reader finds out that he has been doing these interviews, he has been uh, recording her, her voice, been trying to write a story out. And then the second story in the, in the, 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 the past, um, <clears throat> sorry, <clears throat> the historical strand in a novel is meant to be Kevin's written version of her story. So that's when it becomes intimate and that's when we can access her thoughts because he has taken the trouble to do it. Mm. Uh, whereas in real life, I don't think it would have been easy to do that because being a woman who doesn't speak English, an elderly woman who's cut off from quite a few aspects of society in Singapore, you wouldn't have been able to get to that point where you could talk to her and be as close as you are in the book. Mm -hmm. so. um, and Jacob, your novel sort of also weaves back and forth, but it's really people from the past. So for example, Nathan, uh, Digger's mom, among others who are haunting the lives of those in the present. Could you talk a little bit about uh, sort of what you were saying about the past and its relationship to to your characters present um, and what was it something was there something you were trying to say about wider history as well or was it very specific to the individuals yeah um, well I think you know one of the things and I'm not even necessarily the one who sort of came up with this observation there are many 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 writers and thinkers and even singers like um, who point out that Bob Marley, for, Bob Marley, for example, the singer, he says that in this great future, you can't forget the past. And there are those of us, I mean, I'm certainly one of those people who believe that the past is very present. It's present in people's attitudes, in, the, in their culture, in what they value, what they don't value. Um, a great, what, I mean, I would suggest that the British sense of its Britishness comes from its past, come from that big chunk of its, come from its history, or its idea of its history, if I were to be more, more thinking about it. And um, with my character, I mean, I don't do all that sort of intellectual gymnastics, but my character, he, he is absolutely driven by a past which is very present, which is to do with the disappearance of his mother, his, one of his mother, she, she kissed him, he's an eight-year-old, she kisses him and tells him she's going to be back. 
and she goes out there to protest against the violation of a girl, of a child uh, on the street, and she never comes home. She never returns. And, and, and you notice that how fierce he, he, he gets whenever any of his female friends is threatened. He just goes berserk. Mm -hmm. And that in a way is, you know, and, and he has predominantly, I would even go as far as he has only female friends. You know, the people he value most are the women in his life, his friends, his, his colleagues, and, and so on and so forth. But if ever um, any one of them is, is threatened, he just loses it completely. So what, what one can ask oneself the question, what is it that's happening there with him? And it's probably the sense of having lost the thing, the, the, the woman that meant most to him, that any woman in his life who is threatened he absolutely, you know, falls back into this sort of extremely dangerous person. So yes, and, and in a way, it's 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 a kind of metaphor also for how history acts on us, how 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 our memories, our historical memory, um, acts on us, and how in fact sometimes how convenient how convenient it is. For, for, for some people to dismiss one person's history and say, oh, well, that happened a long time ago, you know, um, while, while hanging on to their history. If, if, if I speak about um, the, you know, the arrival in the 17th century, 18th century of Africans to the Caribbean 400 years ago, that's about five, 10 generations ago, I get told, well, that's a long time ago. But, and then I would say, well, okay, but Shakespeare happened around that time too. Does that mean that Shakespeare is irrelevant? Yeah. And look at the extent to which, which Shakespeare is part of the national fabric, mm. culturally speaking. You know, look at the extent to which the Tudors are, you know, are part of the national fabric. And I respect that and value that. But then again, you know, it's, it's to do with memory and what we choose to remember and what we choose to value mm. and how memory, how history and how memory shape us in the present these 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 things these elements um i'm afraid we're almost at the end of our time together so just one final question for the both of you and i'd like to um bring it back to sort of the commonwealth and the and the big jubilee read i was wondering if there were any authors and books on the on the list that you particularly love or whose work has influenced you or, or sort of writers that you perhaps look to for inspiration I have loads, <laughs> you know, unfortunately. I, have a, I mean, I have, I have a whole kind of library <laughs> in my head. Um, the, I, you know, I, I loved Marcus's book. Um, the that has been, I mean, it's an incredible book for many way, um, in many, in many, many, many ways. That's the book Thief, you know, mm -hmm. because um, it's one of the best books I've read in the past decade or so, largely because um, I just loved the way he literally reinvigorated, you know, the omniscient narrative voice, which people had thought, you know, you know thinking were dead, you know, you have this character, this God voice, who literally controls the book. And I thought that that was an apps. For me, it was one, of, it's a brilliant book. And it's a book about, it's quite resonant, it's quite contemporary. So because it's a book about an invasion, about people in war, not all that different from Jin Jing's book, you know? It's a book about people ordinary humans swept up, you know, by this awful thing that is war. And we know what's happening right now in, in Europe, in Eastern Europe. So, so that, that I wanted to mention. I think that all of the books, and I'm not, I'm saying this as humbly as I possibly can, all of the books by People Treat Press are good books because we have such, we have an excellent and very selective editor in Jeremy Pointing, who is the managing editor. And, and the, these books win prizes, they bought you with the Costa Prize, you name all the big, you know, it's a very small press with about four people, two key people, but it's a, it's a very small press that punches way above its weight, yeah? So I would just say, you know, go on there, and there are, quite, there are a couple of them on the, um, on, on the list, the reading list over the past uh, mm -hmm. 70 years. Um, and I can just go on and on because, I, as I said, I have loads of books that I can. I would like to mention um, Olive Senior. She's a 
uh, a writer who lives in Canada, but she's Jamaica and Olive Sydney, I think is very special as a writer. I can just keep on listing books mm -hmm. um, and I can give you a list of all of the contemporary writers, the writers to look out for. Mm -hmm. I have a list of their names also. I'm not sure we have the time for that. <laughs> we'll have to get a glimpse at your bookshelves another time. Um, do, yes. Are there any that you want to sort of, any, any books or authors that you want to mention? Um, I think on the list itself, I have loved White Circuit Associate by Jean Rees. Uh, the first book that introduced me to the idea of writing back to the empire, that it's informing my current work in progress. Um, and of course, I love Arundhati Roy and uh, Ishiguro. And, Jean, and, yeah. Jean Rees, by the way, is a Caribbean writer. A lot of people yeah, tend to want to forget that. She's from, she's from a very small island, very close to the one that I'm from. It's called Dominica. She's yeah. not, uh, and, and I want people to remember that, Jean Reese. Um, anyway, go ahead. No, and I, I totally get it. And and um, I know about the history, so that, that's why I was uh, interested in the idea of, you know, writing back because of Jean Reese. Um, but I think for books that are not on the list, uh, there are a couple from Singapore, to be very specific. Um, I, Jerry Tiang, who is quite a well-known translator, from Chinese to English. He wrote a book called uh, State of Emergency, which is about the emergency in Malaya when um, there's a massacre that happened during the emergency. Um, that's about that. And also Jolene Tan's After the Inquiry, which is set in modern day Singapore. And it's about um, um, internal affairs investigation into something that went wrong within the police. And it's about how insidious bureaucracy can get. Uh, so I think, uh, to be very specific, these are books that I would recommend. That's brilliant. You've both added lots of books to everyone's to read list. So thank you for that. And um, that is unfortunately all we've got time for. But thank you so much, Jacob and Jing, for your time today. And next up, I'm going to be joined by Marcus Suzak. Marcus is the author of six novels and is most well known for The Book Thief, which has been translated into more than 40 languages since publication in 2005 and has been made into a film. Told from the perspective of death, as we just heard Jacob talking about, it follows Liesel, a young girl living in Nazi Germany with foster parents who are conceiving a Jewish man. Welcome, Marcus. I'm so happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Um, it's been it's been more than 15 years, if my maths is correct, um, since the book Thief came out. And I'm guessing much longer still since you wrote it. But I wonder if uh, you could dig back into your memory and briefly talk about the inspiration for the book. Yeah, oh, it's, it is. It's 17 years really since that book came out. And obviously the time writing it, I was in my late 20s. Uh, so I guess you could say it's 20 years since I sort of started writing it. And um, I had this idea, for, I'd written three short novels and uh, I thought, oh, I'm, I'm going to write a, a non-fiction book. Uh, and I'll, I want to, I just had all these great stories from my mum and dad about growing up in Germany and Austria, uh, sort of mostly after the Second World War. And I thought, I'm going to write my mum's story and uh, the you know the really interesting thing and I only remembered this recently was mm -hmm. that I had this really awful title idea which was because she she always talked about how after the war uh, they were occupied in Munich by American soldiers and in the town that she was in and she loved listening to the radio station the American radio station and at lunchtime they had a lunch hour and the American uh, you know, soldiers and, you know, the radio station, they couldn't say Munich in the way Germans say it, which is München. Uh, and, you know, so they called Munich München. And, uh, and so the radio hour at lunchtime was called Luncheon in München. And, uh, and so I often joke with people, like if I'm speaking at a library or something, that, you know, could have been the book thief, could also have just been called Luncheon in München. And uh, it always gets a bit of a reaction of just, uh, I think it was probably good you went with the book thief. Uh, but the inspiration for the book really just came, oddly enough, and I think it's sort of fitting with what we're talking about here in general and, uh, you know, in, in terms of, you know, living in the Commonwealth and so on, is that a story set in Nazi Germany narrated by death actually started in a backyard in 36-degree heat in Sydney 
you know, where I'm playing cricket and football and, you know, rugby in the backyard with my brother and sometimes my older sisters. And uh, we'd come inside and we'd hear these stories. And my mum and dad never said to us or sat us down and said, now we're, we're going to tell you where you come from. Mm-hmm. They just, just every now and again, something would remind them. You know, if there was a thunderstorm, uh, which is often the case in Sydney in, you know, in the evening in summer, uh, my mum would say, oh, this is like when we had to go to the bomb shelters, you know, and she'd tell us these stories. And there was always, you know, they, these are, they were amazing stories, but they also had humour in them. Um, you know, there was terrible sadness, uh, you know, and so I grew up hearing stories of, you know, people being marched down the street to, you know, you know really, you know, uncertain, deadly futures and kids who would give these people, you know, bread on the, on the way on the street. And then, every, you know, the, the person taking the bread would be whipped by a soldier and so would the kid who gave them the bread. So I had all these stories about, you know, people coming out of bomb shelters in the morning, and which was usually just someone's basement mm-hmm. down the road, and they'd come out and the ground was covered in ice but the sky was on fire. Uh, and that was Munich burning. And uh, so I, I put all these, I had all these stories together in my head as real opposites. And my mum and dad were, you know, who were still alive, they're 89 and 85 years old. And I, I just consider myself really lucky in that, that I just had these parents who had sort of lived through this incredible time you know, for all of its extremes, and yet they're also really good storytellers. And so when I went to write The Book Thief, it was like scratching something open in my mind and reaching in and pulling out that world, and it was like I was there. I didn't have to almost, I didn't almost have to think. It was just an instinct. It was like imagine waking up, you've never spoken, let's say, pick a language, Spanish before, and you wake up one day and you can speak Spanish. That was like the language of that world, like the visual language and, and just what it was like to be there. Mm-hmm. I felt like it just came out on the page. And the last thing I'll say on that before, this is the thing with, with writers, I think, is we've spent so much time alone and then you ask us to start talking and we don't shut up. <laughs> so, uh, so but the last thing was I just set out to write a 100-page novella and it turned into this 500 and... 80 page novel that you know just meant the world to me and so but it started just with my mum and dad's stories and how they just told me that you know they were the lucky ones you know in in the way you know that that things could have been so much more horrible for them and they made it to Australia and uh and then they told their four kids those same stories and one of them turned out to be a writer Mm-hmm. It's it's fascinating that it sort of started as a non-fiction idea and then and then morphed into into what we have what we have now and I definitely want to pick up on your point about language in a moment. Um but first I'd love to talk about um one of the, sort of the I guess one of the things that you get asked about more, most often is this idea of the book being narrated by death and how you came up with that and also how how you decided on death being kind of quite chatty and open and friendly, which I think is so the opposite of, of how we think of death and, and sort of takes away some of that fear that we perhaps have. Yeah, one of my favourite moments over the years, it's been a bit of a recurring moment, is someone comes up to me and says, thank you for your book, you made me feel so much better about dying uh, just because of the voice of death. And I often, and I'll jokingly say, I'm really happy for you because <laughs> I'm still just as afraid as I've always been, you know. Um, but how that happened is I think it's one of the most important things about being a writer in general, but maybe more so a novelist where you get to make, make things up for a living is to pay attention to your accidents and your mistakes and your moments of good fortune, the things that you didn't mean at all, but you just did instinctively. And I already had these two ingredients, which were the stories of my mum and dad and that time in Germany and Austria. And I also just had this, I'd written one page on on that really thin lined paper uh, that I'd written a page called The Book Thief. 
and it was set in modern day Sydney and it was always a girl. I don't know why, but a girl going into an apartment and stealing a book and sort of, you know, looking at the books on the shelves and, and, uh, and talking about them. And so I had these two ideas and, and then they were, they were separate from each other. And then I thought at one point, oh, a girl stealing books. I didn't think about book burnings and Hitler's use of words or anything thematically at all, but I just instinctively knew that those two ideas fit together of that time and, and, and a book thief. And then I had the idea of death by just working at a school with these four kids at this school I was working in who they were interested in writing. And so we had a little writing club and I got them to write this a story. And, you know, it was the old lazy teacher's way of saying, I'm going to give you a first line. And the first line, I still remember it was, I have seen the colour of time on three occasions. You know, I thought it's meaningless. And then I said, and I'll write with you. And I wrote these three really short pieces about someone dying. And it was from the point of view of death. And then I went, maybe put that in that book set in Nazi Germany. Not, not, not thinking deeply. You know, I think it's really important, you know, to sort of demystify this idea that writers think deeply about everything and we start with this great purpose and yeah we do start with a, you know a purpose but half the time it's playing around and hoping that the, the really good idea will come and then I started with death I wrote 150 pages really quickly but death was exactly what you were talking about that more typical version where he was kind of enjoying his work too much around, you know, this time, you know, and I was like, oh, and he was saying the most awful things. He was really sinister. And I just went, it's not quite right, you know, and, and I think you spend so much time writing where, you know, and I say this to people all the time where I go, they say, what is the writing process? What does that even mean? And I say, well, for me, it's writing something and going, well, that's not it. And, and then writing and trying again and going, well, that's not it, that's not it, that's not it, until finally then in the case of, say, using death as a narrator, I went to Liesl narrating the book, then just a third person. So death wasn't, was a natural choice but not, not a natural fit. Mm -hmm. And then it was when I thought of the last line of the book, um, which I never disclose, um, where I, and I just sort of thought, that's it. What if death was afraid of us? And what if death was afraid for us and actually kind of liked humans and was just this sort of missing piece of us. And that was when I, I really got to play with the idea of language in, and I wanted death to say things that didn't quite make sense the way we do. Like he would say the sky who was wide and blue and magnificent and the trees who were standing over to the right. And it was sort of like death talked about us and the trees and the world is all part of the same thing as kind of colleagues. Mm -hmm. And uh, that I didn't set out to do that. I just did that by getting to know the book and getting to know what the hell <laughs> I was trying to do because I was lost for quite a long time uh, mm -hmm. while I was writing it. But figuring it out is, you know, where you, you then use all your bits and pieces that didn't work and it all finally comes together, I guess, like, putting disparate parts into a car to get it to run. Mm. It's fascinating to hear you talk about kind of the, the things that just sort of came together and then perhaps some of the more deliberate stuff that came after. And uh, with Jing and Jacob, uh, we spoke about language because both of their books, like, like your book, use language in a really interesting way. And so The Book Thief is written in English with death narrating presumably in I feel like in English but it might be different for different readers but the other characters all speak German and sometimes death translates the meaning of certain terms or certain phrases for us and sometimes the characters will say something in German and then within their speech marks will be the English translation as well and um, how did you sort of approach the ways in which the characters were going to use language and how you were going to present that to us? Yeah I I grew up in a household that was playing with language in that way, I suppose, in that my mum and dad would say literally nine, if it was a 10-word sentence, eight of those words would be in English and two would be in German mm -hmm. and vice versa. And, and so I always grew up with this sort of idea that you would just mix and match and do what worked and something would sound funnier or, or better expressed that way. 
And uh, and so I, I took a very, I actually, in that case, I think I just wanted to take a really common sense approach where if I, I just wanted to help, I didn't ever want people who couldn't understand German, obviously, to feel hindered by, by and so, and it gave me, and death was a really good foil for that. It was like, as soon as I used death as a narrator, uh, it was like all bets were off on everything. Yeah, and, and that was why we'd have these almost ludicrous descriptions of the sky and of people's features. And it was almost like through this, this new lens um, that death was using, and it allowed me to just play. And I always think of, uh, you know, my favourite, one of my favourite images from any novel ever is from Michael Chauvin's uh, The Amazing Adventures of Cavalier and Clay, uh, where he's, he describes a, a big ocean liner coming into New York Harbour. And he says, the Rotterdam came into New York Harbour like a mountain wearing a dinner jacket. Uh, yeah, oh, it's such, you know, such a great use of language, you know, and it's, it's, it's showing us the world in a way we've never seen it before and yet we understand it. And so in terms of my use of death's language and the, the translations, it was just all a way of, of just playing, but in a, in a common sense way, just so that the reader was always, I feel like death was always saying to the reader, come, you can come a little further, mm. come a little further with me, you know, and it's safe. Look, I, it's, it's really safe. Like terrible things are going to happen, but I'm even going to tell you in advance that they're going to happen and what's going to happen, um, you know, which was such a, I mean, I, there was so much that was instinctive writing that book where I'd go, we're halfway through the book. Let's just tell everyone now that Rudy, my favourite character, dies. Let's do it now. And people have questioned me about that. Oh, why did you give it away? And I said, because death doesn't tell a story the way we do. He just, he's happy to spoil it. You've got, um, you've got that great line in there about just sort of, just before we get to halfway where you sort of, I think it's at that moment where you, where death sort of says, oh, Rudy, Rudy dies. Not at this point, but, you know, at this point. And I think you've got that great line about how sort of it's, it comes to how, what happens doesn't really matter, but how it happens is the fascinating yeah. kind of part. So it's something along those, sorry. I actually of... remember, I can <laughs> help you out. You're allowed to, you know, you didn't write the book. <laughs> I should know what it is, uh, uh, even all these years later, but I think he says something along the lines of mystery bores me, it chores me. And even that's just a, almost like a, an eight-year-old just rhyming words. And he says, you know, it's the machinations of, of how we get there. Uh, that interest me and I think what he's saying or maybe what I, I didn't realize this is what I was doing and I think that's one of my favorite things about being a writer is you don't really know what you mean half the time and you but the more you go through it and work on it you you figure it out but I think one of the main reasons I, I did give that away with Rudy and especially him being such a favorite you know probably the favorite character I've, I've written uh, for myself is um, is that everything great he does from that point on almost has extra meaning mm -hmm. because we know he's going to die and that his time is not unlimited. He's not going to become an old man. Uh, he's he's going to die in these pages, you know, not far from here. So um, yeah, there were all. I realised that there were all sorts of reasons for you know me doing that, but I just didn't know what they were exactly at the time. It just mm -hmm. felt. One of the things I wondered if you did know at the time was uh, so often we we sort of think of writing writers and you're there with with, you know, your sort of notepads of handwritten script or your, you know, stacks of typewritten manuscript. I wonder if you knew visually how the book was going to look. So those those sort of parts that are like centred and in bold and perhaps a, a slight list or things like that. How early on in the process did did those come? Yeah, I think it was, I, I, I remember, I can see myself doing it. Uh, I was up quite late one night. And this is, this is the danger with these sorts of events is you start to confess things <laughs> maybe you shouldn't confess, is that I was up sort of late and I had watched quite recently, I'd watched Fight Club. Okay. And there's that bit in it where, Tyler Durden is just, he's got, he's built his army, you know, to cause mayhem and he's reciting all this stuff to them. Uh, you know, he's just really indoctrinating them and he's saying, you are not special. 
You are not me. You are not. You are human compost. You are going to die. You are. And then I'd written with death as the narrator, and it was all seemed okay, you know, the prologue. And I'd written some more um, of the book, probably a hundred pages. And then I was just going over that beginning. And then just at that point, at the after the first three lines, I heard that voice in my head: "You are going to die." And I went. And then I thought, "Oh, here is a small fact. Here is a small fact." you are going to die and when I looked at as I looked at the page or I thought about it I saw that in bold print in the middle and that these are the moments and these are those accidents that I'm talking about is you don't ask any questions you just go put in the middle Mm -hmm. and then you leave it you don't don't mess with it and then then I just felt like doing it again (laughs) again and and there are points now where I think I might have overdone it a little bit and especially there were times whenever I was struggling I'd sort of go, time to put something in the middle. And there were some that were like a page and a half long. (laughs) And I thought, I think we need to cut some of these back. And and I did. But, you know, then I started to think of them as these little grave headstones Mm. of these announcements. And that's how they looked on the page. And and I just sort of thought, you know, I think my my greatest sort of advice, well, not advice, the best advice my mum and dad ever gave me was after losing an athletics race once when I was a kid and I was upset that I lost and I thought I'd won and they put me in sixth spot and my dad said to me afterwards when I was complaining, he said, you know, he said, I thought you won as well, you know, to tell you the truth. He said, but you made a big mistake. He said, you didn't win by enough. You have to win by so much that they can't take it off you. And what's my point when it comes to writing? I can't be better than anyone else. I'm, you know, I mean, look, look, look who we're dealing with in the world. You know, Salman Rushdie exists, you know, (laughs) Zadie Smith exists, you know, yeah, it's not, I'm never going to be better than them. I'm never going to be, yeah, but what you can do, what you can do is write a book that is so much like yourself that only you could have written it. Mm. And for me, that's what the book thief is. There are better books than the book thief. There are, there are more, much better te- books technically you know, for all sorts of reasons, but the book thief is the book that only I could have written. And, uh, and, and that, if nothing else, is, is probably why I'm, I'm proud of it. You know, I'm sort of proud for my mum and dad's sake as well because, you know, they gave me those stories. I mean, you say, you say there are probably better books, but, I mean, the Book Thief was an international bestseller. It's been translated into so many languages. And I wonder if, given that it is partially a book that does play with language and is about books and reading, did it surprise you that it translated to so many audiences? Or do you think, given that it is a book about human connection and, and kind of so many other things, that actually that is universal and that didn't... Su- I mean, I imagine it would have surprised you in a pleasant way, but, but the, mm. given... Did it kind of were you sort of unsurprised that the the message of the book uh, spoke to so many people? Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. It It's one of those things where that at cert, definitely at the time when I was writing it, I honestly, I, I really, I just thought this is going to sink, this is going to sink without trace. It's getting bigger. And, you know, and I, and I do make this sort of joke where I, I say, I just thought it would sink without a trace because I'd ima- I would imagine people try to recommend it to their friends. You know, a friend says, what's it about? You say, well, okay, it's set in Nazi Germany. It's narrated by death. You know, it's nearly 580 pages long. You'll love it, you know. And I've, and I've made that joke many times over the years and now I realise that that is its, that's also its greatest appeal is that, you know, we all have, different dietary needs at different times and sometimes we we want that 500 page book set you know in a certain time and place and I just like when I look back now I kind of understand why it worked and and I think and I and I realized that I and more than anything else I think I realized that I'd written these characters that I really loved I really loved um, everyone from, you know, Liesl was this character in the middle surrounded by this support cast of, you know, I think, you know, really, you know, characters who they, they were alive to me and it's not any, and, and they, were, they were good people, 
you know, everyone from Hans to Rosa, who, uh, to, who was good in her own specific kind of way, but was based on my mum's own foster mother and who did wait at the river's edge with the wooden spoon, uh, you know, threateningly, you know, um, as my mum refused to swim back over. And, you know, but Max and, you know, Max was nearly cut out of the book at some point. So the young Jewish man that the humans hide in, in their basement because I couldn't get him to work. You know, and you're always just trying to get, I mean, it is unthinkable, yeah. you know, that, that he wouldn't be in the book. And because without Max, there's no standover man, uh, you know, the, the, the picture book that, you know, that's written over, you know, painted over pages of Mein Kampf. You know, there are so many just little, you know, so when I look back now, I understand why it was, why it was successful, but I didn't know at the time. And that's probably a good thing. Uh, because as soon as you're expecting and hoping something to be successful, you know, it's a sure way to be disappointed. But I still am so grateful to that book because it's, you know, it's been a doorway to the world. I mean, without that book, I mean, obviously I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you and having this sort of great opportunity, you know. So sometimes, you know, it's like they say, you have a golden day sometimes and this book's given me a lot of golden days so I'm, I'm really grateful not only to the book but to to readers uh who've picked it up and given it to their friends and loved it and and uh you know and and publishers who took a bit of a gamble on on the book as well and um, so you just mentioned sort of sitting here today and, and your book is part of the big jubilee read um sort of literature and storytelling across the commonwealth and i wondered if you could talk a little bit about how and and, and and I know you've sort of touched on this, but um, in in that regard, how can books help us to understand kind of global histories? Even though you said that this is a very personal book in a lot of ways, it is all it does sort of speak to something bigger as well. Yeah, well, I feel like books books are still, and I know this is a bit, uh, you know, maybe twee or cliche, but books are that great. Uh, are such a they're still the greatest technology as far as I'm concerned but I am a little bit biased but people say to me you know we talk about movies and television and music and but I often talk about movies and books and I say the the, the reason I love movies is because I can see the characters you know mm -hmm. and, and see it all happen in front of me but the reason I love books is I get to be the characters I feel like it's because uh, books I feel like you just climb inside of and uh, and you, you're having such a personal experience with a book and you're doing that little bit of work that you need to do and uh, and you'll see you get to see the characters the, the amount of times I've seen I've had characters described in a book and I see them differently to how you know the next person has seen the you know and I, I love all those different discrepancies and so I still feel like books are that intimate thing where you connect at an even deeper level. And, uh, you know, and, and that's, it is such a personal thing, but that's where you can become that character from an island somewhere totally, you know, different from, from where you're living and, and that it happens inside the pages of a book. It's been the thing that's made all the difference to my life, you know, and a lot of, and, you know, and all readers' lives, I think. Yeah, and um, we're almost at the end of our time together and there's so much that we could talk about but um I wanted to end with the same question to you as I did with Jing Jing and Jacob and um, are there any authors and books on this big jubilee read list that you love or whose work has influenced you yeah well I think it, it's so it's you you I think you start at home and, uh, you know, so for me, obviously, Cloud Street by Tim Winton is such a beloved book in Australia, uh, you know, and, and so is The Secret River. And, and but it's funny, I, like, I, I really love, and then, then you've got Next Door and Mr Pitt by Lloyd-Jones is one of my favourite, favourite mm -hmm. books. And, uh, you know, and then, you, then you've got the big ones, yeah, uh, of recent times where, you know, I often look at, white teeth and I go damn <laughs> oh damn I think a lot of us do <laughs> yeah yeah and uh, and and of course 
you, you can't go past the handmaid's tale and you there, there is so and but the thing for me like looking at the list is going all right here's here's my next sort of reading challenge is saying right 70 years, seven decades, you've got to read a book from every decade now. And so I think that's what I'm going to try try to do next. And maybe I should start a book club with my wife on that and we can challenge each other. But, um, you know, but what an amazing thing to be a part of. Uh, so, and a yeah, special mention to, to um, you know, Whale Rider uh, mm-hmm. has, was, uh, yeah, I, and I, I tend to like those sort of books as well that are about youth as well and, and that's one of the great ones but um yeah so it, it it it's one of those lists where you go oh well, this was such a great idea because i think it's awakened a lot of us to books that we want to read next for sure for sure that is all we have time for thank you so much marcus really appreciate you you being here um, and for everyone watching you can find out more about marcus jingjing and jacob's books and the whole big jubilee read book list at bbc.co.uk forward slash arts and if you're in a reading group uh, marcus this might be one for you if you want to set up a reading <laughs> group there are resources for all 70 books on the list at readinggroups.org a book from each decade on the list is being featured on bbc twos between the covers which you can catch up with on iPlayer and of course you can purchase the books from your local bookshop or borrow them from your library. Thank you to Arts Council England for making this event possible, thank you to everyone watching and most of all thank you to our three authors Jing Jing Lee, Jacob Ross and Marcus Zuzak for their time and insights. Goodbye.